The six-year Battle of the Atlantic was the longest campaign of World War II and one of the most critical. If the Royal Navy failed to keep the supply lines to Britain open, the island would be quickly starved into surrender. Any hope of freeing Europe from Nazi tyranny would be gone. But the sailors of the Royal Navy rose to the challenge. In all weathers and often against massive odds, they fought off Germany's U-boats and ensured that the merchant navy could bring in the vital supplies to keep the Allied cause alive. The Royal Navy was also in action in every ocean of the world, from the Arctic to the Pacific. The war at sea was to bring many bitter defeats and terrible losses. But by 1945, the fleets of three great opponents, the Axis powers, Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy and Imperial Japan had been humbled. On the day war began, a signal flashed around the fleet. Winston is back. Churchill returned on the 3rd of September 1939 as First Lord of the Admiralty, the position he had occupied at the outbreak of World War I. The navy he took over was still the largest in the world, with 15 battleships and battlecruisers and seven aircraft carriers. For centuries it had been both Britain's main defence against invasion and guardian of her empire. The Royal Navy's sailors were all long service professionals who knew they inherited a great fighting tradition. But for many of the young men recruited during the depression of the 1930s, it also represented a great escape. I think the furthest I'd been was to Plymouth. <laughs> uh, Torquay and that sort of thing, but never uh, any great distance. Well, you didn't get around too far on a, on a push bike. <laughs> It was a whole new world, and the beautiful sunshine and all the rest. <laughs> yes, it was quite nice. The Navy they joined had two main fleets. The Home Fleet, based in wartime at Scapa Flow in the Orkneys, and the Mediterranean Fleet, based at Malta and Alexandria. There were also smaller commands in the North and South Atlantic, the Caribbean and the Far East. Despite its size, the Royal Navy would face an enormous task if all three Axis powers came into the war simultaneously. Its young men were unaware of the demands which would soon be made on them. I mean, when you're young, you, I mean, you're sort of brought up on heroics and adventure and the, and the cinema, Hollywood and all this lot, isn't it? You never thought about getting killed or wounded or, or anything else, you know. It was an adventure. The adventure entered a grimmer phase as the fleet went to battle stations and officers and men of the reserves were recalled to duty. At the start of the war, the immediate enemy was the German Kriegsmarine, which had begun a massive expansion program. In 1939, this was far from completion, but the German Navy was still formidable. Its five pocket battleships and battlecruisers were specifically designed to raid the supply lines, and a large number of the Royal Navy's major warships were needed to pin them down. More sinister were the U-boats. Germany entered the war with 57, half of which were ocean-going types, and 120 more were planned. The U-boats quickly proved dangerous. Just two weeks after war began, 
U-29 sank the aircraft carrier Courageous in the North Sea. And less than four weeks later, the supposedly impregnable anchorage at Scapa Flow was breached in a daring raid which sank the battleship Royal Oak. Returning to Germany, U-47's captain, Gunter Prien, became a national hero. But it was the surface raiders which were the main threat to British trade in the early months of the war. The pocket battleship Graf Spee totally disrupted the sea lanes in the South Atlantic and Indian Oceans throughout the autumn of 1939. She was eventually brought to bay by a Royal Navy squadron of three cruisers, and a fierce battle took place at the mouth of the River Plate. Although outgunned and severely damaged, the cruisers forced Graf Spee to run for shelter in neutral Uruguay. And two days later, her captain scuttled her rather than allow the ship to fall into British hands. The Battle of the River Plate was a much needed morale boost for the Royal Navy during the early months of the war. And the crews of the three cruisers were greeted as heroes on their return to Britain. Success was to breed success. In February 1940, the Royal Navy showed its traditional determination when a destroyer squadron led by HMS Cossack pursued the Graf Spee's supply ship Altmark into neutral Norwegian waters. With the rousing cry, the Navy's here, Altmark was boarded, as this hitherto unseen color film shows, and the captured merchant Navy seamen she was taking back to Germany rescued. The protests of a Norwegian gunboat were brushed off. But elsewhere, victory came less easily. The Royal Navy found itself fighting desperately to rescue Britain's armies, first from an ill-fated landing in Norway, and then off the beaches of Dunkirk, as Hitler's panzers swiftly routed the French and British forces. The successful evacuation of 340,000 men was a great achievement, but could not disguise the fact that Britain was now isolated, facing a Nazi-dominated Europe. Following the surrender of France in June 1940, Hitler's growing fleet of U-boats could operate from her Atlantic ports. Access to the ocean was easier, and many more submarines could be on patrol at any one time. Even though the Royal Navy tried to escort all Britain's merchant fleet in convoys, pre-war economies meant that it was desperately short of escort vessels and lacked adequate air cover as its enemy reached deep into the Atlantic. During the autumn of 1940, the U-boats began what their crews called the first happy time. Sinkings rose so rapidly that Britain's shipyards could not provide replacements. German long-range bombers attacked the convoys and brought U-boat wolf packs homing in on them. In desperation, Churchill bartered the use of British naval bases in the Caribbean for elderly US destroyers. But the sinkings continued, and it seemed that the U-boats were close to victory. German surface raiders were also able to break out, and the home fleet's efforts to hunt them down met with no success. Then in May 1941, naval intelligence reported that Bismarck, the first of Germany's two new battleships, had sailed into the Atlantic. The British home fleet set out to intercept it. It was the battle cruiser Hood for long the pride of the Royal Navy, which first sighted Bismarck. In the exchange that followed, Hood was hit in one of her magazines and blew up. Only three of her crew survived. After the attack, Bismarck disappeared into the Atlantic, 
but a day later she was spotted by a Catalina flying boat. Swordfish torpedo bombers from HMS Ark Royal managed to damage her steering gear. The crippled German ship made for the safety of the French port of Brest, but the home fleet had her in its sights. The punishment Bismarck took was amazing. We were thumping salvo after salvo into her. You could see them hit. By the time we finished, we left her burning from stem to stern. One of her, one of her mags must have blown up, and she was sinking. HMS Hood had been avenged. Some of the intelligence which helped to track Bismarck came from the secret British code-breaking centre at Bletchley Park, which had broken the German Enigma code. And in the same month, the cryptographers there received a priceless advantage when the frigate HMS Bulldog forced U-110 to the surface, capturing a complete naval Enigma machine with all its code settings. U-boats could now be tracked with much more accuracy, and convoys warned of their presence. Also, an increasing number of escorts was now being built. The backbone of these was the corvette, armed with depth charges and a four-inch gun, and with a crew of some 100 men. They were sturdy little ships, but very unstable in heavy seas. One officer who served in them claimed that they could roll on wet grass. Attempts were also being made to provide the convoys with some air cover. Hurricane fighters were mounted on catapults on merchant ships. But they were a weapon of last resort, since they could not land back on deck and had to be ditched after a single mission. By July 1941, the odds at sea had tipped back to the Royal Navy. Improved equipment and training and the growing combat experience of the escort crews brought the U-boat's happy time to an end. It was not a moment too soon. In June, Hitler attacked the Soviet Union. For the Royal Navy, this dramatic expansion of the war meant a substantial increase in its responsibilities and a further stretching of its resources. In September, the first British convoys taking aid to Russia began to brave the appalling Arctic seas and a brutal new campaign, which would last for almost four years, had begun. Hitler responded by building up his naval and air forces in Norway, among them the battleship Tirpitz, Bismarck's sister. She comfortably outgunned any British rival, and for the next three years, her presence as a threat to both the Arctic and Atlantic convoys would preoccupy the British home fleet. Just as the Tirpitz reached Norway, the war expanded again. Following up Japan's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, Hitler declared war on the United States. the U-boats moved into American waters. The refusal of the US Navy's Commander-in-Chief, Admiral King, to learn from the Royal Navy's hard-won experience and introduce convoys gave them a second happy time. For months, the British escort crews had to watch helplessly as the ships they had shepherded across the Atlantic were sunk, often within sight of brightly lit American coastal resorts. Allied losses during the first six months of 1942 were the worst in the Battle of the Atlantic. The German naval high command took advantage of the Royal Navy's new preoccupation. The battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau and the cruiser Prince Eugen had been trapped in the French port of Bordeaux for many months. Now they managed to escape. 
Early on the morning of the 11th of February, 1942, the German squadron slipped out of harbour. In fog and low cloud, they raced up the channel and were not spotted until almost midday when they were nearing the Straits of Dover. The first British response was an attack by motor torpedo boats based at Dover. Because I wouldn't normally have seen anything being down below on the radio, but the radio packed up. I shouted up the voice pipe. Couldn't get any sense up there. It was just all shouting and hollering and panic stations. And so I went up top. Wow. And I thought the old German Navy was after me. Just me alone, you know, battleships, destroyers, minesweepers, e-boats 20, 30 yards away, sky black with Messerschmitts. I told the skipper that the radio had packed up, so he said, uh, grab a gun. Anyway, I got hold of a rifle, pointed it at the Scharnhorst, just to try and look brave. The motor torpedo boats were ineffective. They were followed with a virtually suicidal attack by slow and lumbering swordfish torpedo bombers. The Germans watched in amazement as the fleet air arm crews, led by Lieutenant Commander Eugene Esmond, pressed home their attacks in the face of intense fire. All six planes were shot down before they could score a hit on any of the German ships. Esmond was later awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross for his selfless courage. The German squadron reached port safely. Now all the Kriegsmarine's major ships were concentrated in northern waters. For the British home fleet, the threat to the Arctic convoys seemed all the greater following the Channel Dash. Even though the US and Canadian navies were now playing a growing part in the convoy war, most of the burden still fell on the thinly stretched Royal Navy. Losses increased, and the threat of the Tirpitz in particular obsessed naval planners. The fear that she might intervene led to a tragedy when convoy PQ-17 set sail from Iceland on the 27th of June, 1942. It had a strong escort and a powerful backup force, which included both British and US ships. But when the Royal Navy's Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Sir Dudley Pound, received intelligence reports that Tirpitz was on the move, he assumed that the support group was too distant to intercept. To the astonishment of the man on the spot, the close escort commander, Jackie Broom, he ordered the convoy to scatter. It shook us all to the core. We didn't, we had got no reason to believe that, uh, that there was anything to scatter about. It only, could only mean one thing, and that was that she was here. She was, she was on the horizon. Up went all our glasses, focusing on various quarters of the horizon, and I remember expecting somebody to say, there she is, there's a gun flash, something like that. So I thought, well, there's no time to lose. She might be on us, she probably is on us. So I shot into the convoy in Keppel, went alongside the Commodore, switched on the loud hailer, and said, I'm sorry about this or something. And he, you could see the Commodore standing on the wing of the ridge. He didn't seem to believe it. The Tirpitz never got within range of the convoy, but the Luftwaffe and the U-boats massacred the defenseless merchant vessels. Only 10 out of the original 33 reached the Russian port of Murmansk. Following the disaster, the convoys were suspended for several months. When they resumed, the Royal Navy's escorts were much stronger. This paid off on the last day of 1942, when a foray by the German cruisers Hipper and Lützow was repulsed. Hitler was so angry that he sacked his naval commander-in-chief, Admiral Erich Raeder, and threatened to deactivate the surface fleet. But Raeder's successor, 
U-boat chief Karl Dönitz persuaded Hitler that the warships were essential to pin down the Royal Navy's home fleet. Dönitz exploited the greatly increased U-boat production. He could now keep more than 60 boats at sea continuously. And at the beginning of 1943, they sank seven out of nine oil tankers in one vital convoy. The Germans never came so near to disrupting communications between the new world and the old as in the first 20 days of March 1943, said a British Admiralty report a few months later. In two massive convoy battles in the North Atlantic, 39 merchant ships and two escorts were sunk for the loss of only three U-boats. The spring gales brought a lull in April, but this level of Allied losses could not be tolerated. But patient work by the Royal Navy was about to pay off. Admiral Max Horton had taken over as commander of naval forces in the North Atlantic in November 1942. Four months later, he was at last given sufficient long-range aircraft to cover the whole of the North Atlantic. New escort carriers, which could accompany the convoys and lead hunter groups, were coming into service. The convoy escorts were now immensely experienced with improved detection equipment and tactics. When the turning point came in the Battle of the Atlantic, it was sudden and dramatic. Convoy ONS-5, with 43 merchant ships, left Britain for North American ports towards the end of April. Within a few days, it was being hounded by no less than 40 U-boats, almost one for each merchantman, the largest wolf pack of the war. On the 29th of April, the Germans claimed their first victim. But then a Royal Canadian Air Force Catalina retaliated and sank one U-boat. One of the convoy escort vessels accounted for another with its depth charges. One of the Royal Navy's most experienced escort commanders, Peter Gretton, began the fight back. We had a very heavy battle with about 20 U-boats. Uh, we sank three of them and didn't lose one single ship, which was extremely satisfactory. By the end of the action, nine U-boats had been sunk for the loss of 12 merchant ships. During the rest of the month, the Germans lost 32 more submarines. This was more than double the previous worst monthly figure, and Admiral Dönitz was forced to withdraw his boats temporarily from the Atlantic. The U-boats did return, and were still in action until the day the war ended, but they were never again able to threaten the flood of American troops and equipment which crossed the ocean to prepare for the liberation of Europe. The Battle of the Atlantic was the Royal Navy's longest, most vital, and most arduous campaign. The skill and courage of its crews was only matched by the bravery and endurance of the men of the Merchant Navy. By the middle of 1943, the Royal Navy and its Canadian and US allies had seized effective control of the Atlantic sea routes from the U-boats. But in Norway, the threat of the Tirpitz and Scharnhorst remained. Attempts to destroy them by bombing and using the new chariot human torpedoes were unsuccessful. But the Navy had been preparing a new weapon, the midget submarine, or X-craft, designed specifically to penetrate heavily defended anchorages. In September 1943, six X-craft were towed across the North Sea to Norway. Two were lost en route, and X-10, whose target was the Scharnhorst, had to abort her attack when she found that the battlecruiser had put to sea for firing practice. 
But the other three X-craft successfully got into the Altenfjord, where Tirpitz lay. While X-5 disappeared without trace, Lieutenant Cameron in X-6 managed to get through the anti-torpedo nets that protected the battleship. He was spotted after servicing accidentally, but was able to place his charges and scuttle his craft before surrendering. Lieutenant Geoffrey Place in X-7 also had to get through the torpedo nets. We approached to about 400 yards from the ship and went deep to 75 feet because all our measurements and all our intelligence indicated that the nets would not go down to that depth. Uh, in fact, they did, and uh, we ran into the net at 75 feet, perhaps 100 yards from the ship. I backed out, took a long sweep round, and went in again at 95 feet. The depth of water there being 100 feet-ish, so we were only just clear of the bottom. I stopped and gently came up to periscope depth, uh, risking breaking surface even by a small amount, uh, ready to have a good look and see what, where we were. And then, uh, miracle of miracles, we were inside all the nets and there was no further obstacle between us and the ship. Place dived once more and slipped underneath Turpit's hull. He then detached the explosive charges from the sides of his X-craft. As X-7 was heading away, the charges detonated. The shock destroyed X-7's controls and she sank. But Place and one of his three crew survived and were made prisoner. The damage he and Cameron had caused Tirpitz put her out of commission for six months. For their coolness and determination, both Place and Cameron were later awarded the Victoria Cross. But the German surface threat from Norway remained. On the 20th of December, 1943, Convoy JW55B set out from the north of Scotland, bound for northern Russia. Not only did it have a strong, close escort, but Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, commanding the home fleet, was at sea in his flagship Duke of York, with four cruisers and four destroyers. He hoped to lure the battlecruiser Scharnhorst from her Norwegian lair. I think four o'clock in the morning on Boxing Day, I was woken up by a signal from the Edinburgh saying, uh, the Edinburgh believed that Sean Horse is at sea. And that's the only communication I had with the Edinburgh during the whole of the time I was up there. A few hours later, Fraser's ships located Sean Horst and opened fire. Twice, the German battlecruiser managed to slip away into the murk, but each time she was relocated. Eventually, at 6.30 p.m., Sean Horst's guns fell silent as the British pounded her. Fraser sent in his destroyers to finish her off with torpedoes. Scharnhorst now lies off the North Cape of Norway, a memorial to the last battle ever fought between two capital ships using big guns alone. Only 36 of her 2,000-man crew survived to be brought back to Britain as prisoners of war. Elsewhere, the Royal Navy also enjoyed success. In September 1943, its seamen watched the surrender of another enemy they had fought for more than three years. Admiral Andrew Cunningham, commander of the Mediterranean fleet, proudly signaled the Admiralty in London, be pleased to inform His Majesty that the Italian fleet lies at anchor under the guns of the fortress of Malta. It had all been very different in June 1940, when Italian dictator Benito Mussolini had announced that his powerful fleet would drive the British out of Mare Nostrum, our sea. Cunningham's fleet had been severely weakened by the need to send ships to defend Britain, but he was determined to bring the Italian fleet to battle. 
However, a few inconclusive skirmishes were enough to persuade the Italian fleet that it would be safer to stay in port. Cunningham now looked to a new weapon. On the night of the 11th of November, 1940, swordfish aircraft from the carrier Illustrious took off to attack the Italian fleet base at Taranto. Charles Lamb was later interviewed by the BBC. I thought, looking at this intense flag, watching the aircraft go in, that there would be no survivors other than ourselves in our roles of spectator. And uh, on the way back from Tranto, said to my observer, Casey Greve, that I thought we would have to make out a report of what had happened because uh, nobody else would have got back. Um, as it turned out, of course, we only lost two. Three of Italy's six battleships were crippled. 21 obsolete biplanes had rewritten the rules of naval warfare. From now on, air power would be critical. But this triumph only slightly eased Cunningham's other great concern, the defense of Malta. The island's position in the central Mediterranean placed it astride Italy's supply lines to its armies fighting the British in North Africa. Supply convoys to Malta came under constant Axis air attack from Libya and Sicily, and getting them through became one of the Royal Navy's most bitter campaigns of the war. The situation worsened when Churchill decided to send troops to Greece after Hitler intervened to help the Italians in North Africa and the Balkans. The Italian fleet sailed out to intercept the British convoys crossing from Egypt, but Cunningham was waiting. Aircraft from the carrier Formidable torpedoed the battleship Vittorio Veneto, though she managed to limp back to port. Then they crippled the cruiser Pola. The Italians sent ships to her aid. But Cunningham's fleet intercepted them south of Cape Matapan and sank two cruisers and two destroyers. The Germans swiftly overran the Balkans and then turned their attention on the island of Crete. On the 20th of May, they launched an airborne assault against the island. Within a week, the Royal Navy was having to evacuate the defenders while under fierce air attack by the Luftwaffe. One of the ships sunk was the cruiser HMS Gloucester. Only 84 of her crew survived the onslaught. Eventually, they hit us with a salvo of bombs. Where, they, where the bombs landed, I was never sure. I know one hit, hit the bridge, and there were several hit the waist of the ship. I felt somebody dragged me up over the corner of the hatch, yeah, about a foot wide it was, because, you know, the very heavy armoured hatch dragged me through onto the Marines' mess deck. So then we, there were three more people we helped pull through, but they were dead. So we realised they were all drowned down below, so the only thing to do was to close the hatch. Two other cruisers and six destroyers were also lost, but the Navy managed to bring 16,000 soldiers back to Egypt. The strain on the Royal Navy crews was constant. We had very little sleep, and this went on and on and on. The pressure became even greater when the Germans sent more U-boats to the Mediterranean. They dealt the Royal Navy a body blow, sinking first the carrier Ark Royal, which had until now led a charmed life, surviving two previous German claims that she had been sunk. Two weeks later, on the 25th of November, 1941, a U-boat accounted for the battleship Barham.
but even worse was to come. On the night of the 18th of December 1941, Italian frogmen mounted on human torpedoes made an attack on the battleships Valiant and Queen Elizabeth in Alexandria Harbour. They attached magnetic charges to the hulls of both ships, crippling them. Cunningham had no serviceable battleships left, but the next morning he saluted the flag on the quarterdeck as usual, and the Italians never realized that they could use their remaining battleships against the Malta convoys. Instead, the Axis air offensive against the island was redoubled. This stopped the supply convoys from Alexandria. Malta seemed about to be starved into submission. In August 1942, Force H, based at Gibraltar, launched Operation Pedestal, a final desperate attempt to get supplies to the island. A convoy of 14 merchant vessels from Britain, escorted by two battleships, four aircraft carriers, seven cruisers and 32 destroyers, entered the Mediterranean on the 10th. On the following day, a squadron of Spitfires from the carrier Furious flew to bolster the defences of Malta. As they did so, a U-boat attacked the carrier Eagle and sank her with four torpedoes. On the 12th, the force came under sustained air attack again. This time, the aircraft carrier Indomitable had her flight deck wrecked. But amazingly, only one merchant ship had been lost. All that was to change. That evening, the main escort turned back to Gibraltar as planned, leaving four cruisers and 12 destroyers to take the merchant vessels on to Malta. No sooner had this happened than an Italian submarine torpedoed two of the cruisers and the tanker Ohio, which remained afloat. It was the start of an horrific night as Italian and German torpedo boats joined in the action. The third cruiser was sunk, the fourth had to be scuttled, and four of the merchant ships were destroyed. Five more merchant ships were sunk by air attack once daylight came. By evening, only three freighters survived. They were greeted jubilantly as they reached Valletta's Grand Harbor. And 24 hours later, they were joined by the crippled tanker Ohio, which had survived further savage air attacks. Her vital fuel and the supplies from the freighters ensured that Malta could fight on for another two months. Captain Mason, the skipper of the Ohio, was awarded the George Cross, Britain's highest civilian award for gallantry. Operation Pedestal proved to be the turning point in the naval war in the Mediterranean. Royal Navy submarines now joined in a massive campaign to throttle the Axis supply lines to North Africa. This made a substantial contribution to the success of the offensive, which drove the German and Italian forces back a thousand miles from El Alamein to Tunisia, and the landings in northwest Africa, which completed the job of clearing the southern shore of the Mediterranean. The Royal Navy now joined its US partner in supporting the first assaults on the home territory of one of their Axis enemies. In July 1943 came the Allied landings on Sicily and two months later on the Italian mainland. Italy surrendered and as her fleet sailed to Malta to give itself up, the Royal Navy's three-year campaign in the Mediterranean ended in victory. By the autumn of 1943, the naval war in the Mediterranean was effectively at an end and the U-boats in the Atlantic under control. 
Within nine months, the Royal Navy's control of the seas was such that the massive Allied landings on the Normandy coast of occupied France went ahead without any interruption. But Tirpitz, lurking in her Norwegian fjord, remained a major threat. During the spring and summer of 1944, the home fleet launched two air attacks from carriers against her. Although the fleet air arm pressed these home with great skill and courage, it became obvious that its aircraft could not carry weapons powerful enough to inflict significant damage. Eventually, the task of sinking her was passed to RAF Bomber Command. Using the specially developed 12,000-pound Tallboy bomb, Lancaster bombers finally sank Tirpitz on the 12th of November, 1944. The German naval threat from Norway had at last been eliminated. For the men of the Royal Navy, their six-year campaign to save Britain finally ended in May 1945, as the U-boats surrendered. One of them was sailed up the River Thames, flying the White Ensign, and put on display in central London. But the war was not yet over. More than three years earlier, Preparations had begun in the Far East for a crucial blow to the Allies. Japanese aircraft roared in from a carrier task force to catch the US fleet base at Pearl Harbor completely off guard. Other forces advanced simultaneously against the British colonies in Hong Kong and Malaya. As in the West, the Pacific War began disastrously for the Royal Navy. In a vain attempt to reinforce the fleet's main base in Singapore, Force Z, consisting of the battleships Repulse and Prince of Wales, was sent to the Far East. But they lacked air support and were soon caught at sea by Japanese bombers and sunk on the 10th of December. Unable to spare any more ships from European waters, the Navy was forced to withdraw first to Colombo in today's Sri Lanka and then back across the Indian Ocean to the East African port of Mombasa. Although the sea lanes to India were kept open, it was not until 1945, as the European war was coming to an end, that the Royal Navy returned in force to the Pacific. Seven aircraft carriers and four battleships under Admiral Bruce Fraser joined the U.S. Pacific Fleet and fought alongside it during the landings on Okinawa and the final air attacks on the Japanese mainland. Alongside the US Navy, the Royal Navy's ships were subjected to the terrifying ordeal of kamikaze attacks. Although a number of ships were hit, the armored flight decks of the British carriers proved much greater protection than the wooden decks of their American counterparts, and none was sunk or put out of action for long. When General Douglas MacArthur took the formal Japanese surrender on board the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on the 1st of September 1945, Bruce Fraser was present and signed the surrender document on behalf of the British Empire. The sacrifice made by the Royal Navy during World War II was enormous. It lost five capital ships, 10 carriers, 31 cruisers, and 146 destroyers. Over 50,000 of its personnel perished. 
But the spirit which had, over the centuries, made the Royal Navy Britain's bulwark remained as strong as ever. The Navy never hesitated to engage the enemy more closely, as Admiral Horatio Nelson had urged his fleet before the Battle of Trafalgar. The six-year battle fought by the gladiators of the Royal Navy in every ocean of the world not only saved their country, but played a crucial role in saving the free world.